start namaste welcome to another conversation brought to you by indica's center for bharatiya languages cbl our conversation today features retired professor maha mahopadhyay professor korada subramaniam ji korada subramaniam garu is a well known and widely respected sanskrit grammarian and scholar he retired as a professor of sanskrit from the university of hyderabad professor subramaniam was born into a family of vedic scholars hailing from the godavari delta region known as konasima his areas of expertise include one of the systems of indian knowledge the ashtadasha vidya which is really a mind boggling uh, system of knowledge mind boggling in its breadth and depth philosophy of language and translation he is well versed in landmark grammatical works in sanskrit namely the mahabhashya vakya padiya laghu manjusha shloka vartikam and tantra vartikam among others today's indica cbl conversation intends to put the spotlight on dr subramaniam's rare book theories of language oriental and occidental published in 2008 i call it rare because i truly think and i say this after having searched a lot as part of a literature sur- survey for one of my papers that some facets of this book of his are literally unprecedented his research findings some of which we will cover today are likely to be of interest to those concerned with questions related to the origin and development of ancient theories of language the connection of vyakaranam with philosophy sphota more on sphota from the professor later in the talk today and rare comparative analysis of some facets of western linguistics with bharatiya linguistics from a decolonized bharatiya vyakaram perspective and more with that and no further ado let me invite professor korada subramaniam thank you professor welcome to this indica cbl conversation uh thank you for affording time and mind to be with us today thank you i would yeah i would like to start by asking you about uh your motivations to write this book uh could you help me and the other readers uh, and the other listeners uh understand what motivated you to write this book theories of language oriental and occident so actually what happened was uh, i joined as a faculty at the center for applied linguistics and translation studies university of hyderabad in 1988 october so i had a chance to work uh, along with uh, some faculty members who are well versed in western linguistics and there used to be i mean the number of students just like in any other university who were doing mphils and phds in modern linguistics as well so i was also trying to learn as to what is that uh, that is there in western linguistics and how is it different uh, or similar to our indian grammatical tradition uh, generally we take uh, vyakarana padavakya pramana shastra as they are called uh, that is pada shastra means vyakaranam pramana shastra means nyaya vaisheshika and uh, vakya shastra mimamsa so when uh, i was uh, trying to understand uh, there were uh, dissertations uh, of emphils and uh, thesis of uh, phds dumped across the globe uh, where the scholars worked on western linguistics but uh, i could not find a, a perfect uh, analysis uh, just like when you compare with the uh, panini jaimini um, uh, patanjali etc of language uh, and uh, the semantic part also so then i thought it is better to put in a nutshell both the things that is what are there the theories uh, related to language uh, which includes the semantics and uh, also the ones that are there which are be widely being studied uh, called western linguistics so then i thought it is uh, better to bring out a book so that people across the globe will know as to 
what is this uh, linguistic science is. So then I found uh, that um, almost 99% of uh, the uh, so-called theories of Western linguistics are not actually theories, not Siddhantas, but rather they are hypotheses because uh, those people propose something and then uh, they themselves uh, refute their own their findings or others would refute their findings. So it cannot be called a Siddhanta. Whereas in Panini, Jaimini, I mean, Vyakarana, Korami, Mansa, Nyaya, etc. Things once said, Acharya idani pratlana nivartayanti. Out of question, once Acharya says something, it is said forever and no question of revision. So that kind of uh, atmosphere, uh, I mean, just uh, prompted me uh, to uh, note down uh, the findings and uh, put it in a form of a book. Theories of language, Oriental, and Occidental. That is basically okay. right. So basically, uh, when you say that you couldn't find something like that, actually, that speaks to my experience as well. Like I said uh, in your introduction, mm -hmm. that uh, it does seem quite rare, especially from a Bharatiya perspective, mm -hmm. to have done comparative analysis. The mm -hmm. comparative analysis from the other side. Uh, at least there are some works, but from a purely Bharatiya Drishti, uh, I think your work is uh, seems like a very important contribution. Yeah. So thank you for helping us understand uh, some of your motivations on why you, uh, you know, wrote this book. Could we start with now with your title? Why could you explain the title of your book? Why have you called it Theories of Language, Oriental and Occidental? Yes. So here actually Oriental, by the term Oriental I meant uh, uh, the theories that are available uh, in uh, across the Indian subcontinent since time immemorial, because the uh, very basics or the roots of uh, language science are there in uh, Vedas, Vedangas, Darshanas, uh, Upavedas, because uh, in, the, in the book I have collected material from Ayurveda also, Charaka Samhita, Sushya Samhita, Artha Shastra, and so on, for Tantra Yuktis, for example, like that. So that are whatever material is there in these uh, sciences, uh, especially I have covered Shiksha, Vyakarnam, uh, then uh, Yoganishasanam, Vedanta, Koromimansa, uh, and all these uh, Nyaya Vaisheshika. So all these uh, uh, different systems of Indian philosophy I have taken. That I call by the name Oriental theories of language. On the other hand, when I was to take up the uh, task of uh, just uh, put a summarize and putting in uh, a single point of place these theories from Western world, there is something called Russian linguistics, but it did not give much a uh, thought to Russian linguistics. But uh, the material was available from Europe and uh, the Western hemisphere, that is the America, uh, Canada, and so on. So, what I thought a single word should explain as to uh, what I am referring to. What are the books I am referring to? Where they have uh, had they have they had had their birth? Then I thought it is better to call uh, uh, Occidental rather than Western linguistics. So I could I could cover uh, from Germany, England, France, Switzerland, uh, North America, uh, United States, Canada, and all these places and the theories that are uh, there and born there like that. So this is the actual thought I had had behind the uh, styling, naming of uh, this book as Oriental and Occidental. Understand. So did you, did your publisher understand the uh, title easily or did you have any uh, challenges in getting it published with this title? Could you help us understand a little bit uh, of the story behind the title itself or was it really smooth to, to publish it with this title? So, so I have asked a couple of people, then uh, this uh, person which you published, DK Publishers has come forward and uh, they refer to naturally, they refer to some PCA process or something like that. The only problem is there was a nun who studied uh, deeply both the systems, that is Oriental and Occidental. They, there are right. scholars from our Indian subcontinent, but not uh, still in English in which the okay. theories of Western linguists are there. And those Western linguists were slowly getting, I mean, some interest 
into these uh, findings that is in panini etc and but not they were not well versed in indian theories of language especially the grammar and all that so it was a bit difficult to people even to the publishers to uh, refer to a pro professor who knows both the things and who can compare etc so somehow i got uh, these people but uh, i could go forward with not with much difficulty okay right i'm i'm so glad you you did end up writing it and publishing it how much time did it take for you to actually uh, write this book in terms of from the time that you started writing the first chapter to finishing it roughly how much time did it take you uh, roughly actually the preparation took 25 years for me because i joined in 1988 i published this right. in 2008 so right. i was collecting the material trying to understand putting in a single place comparing comparing and contrasting doing what is this what is that uh, 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 checking cross checking etc was doing all this and uh, it took two years for me to sit mm -hmm. down and uh, pen the book because tomorrow nobody should uh, ask me uh, why i am saying this in uh, our uh, tradition once uh, everybody is not allowed to write a book never one second is once right. it is written at the level of acharya acharya means achinoti arthanita acharya who puts together the things that are required in a clear manner and irrefutable impeccable so for right. that i was looking from that point of view from our windows i mean indian ancient indian <laughs> windows rather than the western ones where people go on changing their mind changing their ideas and all that so it took uh, exact uh, correctly to put in putting the form of a book it took two years for me okay okay understand right and i, I want to take up one point which you mentioned a couple of minutes earlier you mentioned some areas of indian philosophy uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on that like what systems of indian philosophy did you take into account uh, you know while elaborating on the different concepts of knowledge could you just you know expand on that point a little bit more for our listeners sure so first uh, it comes the you see in linguistics you have uh, different chapters one for example first phonetics how to pronounce how a shabda right. is born how sound is born uh, from uh, the mouth a person's uh, mouth what is the background uh then shiksha deals with uh, the swara aspect also which is not found in other languages that is accent udatta anudatta swarita like that so first comes shiksha how to pronounce uh, because uh, this uh, is uh, arya uh, sampradaya the ours is uh, sanatan dharma arya sampradaya the pronunciation is given maximum importance no mm. mispronunciation is allowed if you mispronounce uh, that may go wrong Ah, that will right. affect uh, them. We have ill effects also. It is clearly explained right. in Shiksha and Vyakarana. So first, I took uh, uh, politics. That is Shiksha. Okay, and then we went okay. to Vyakarana, which is considered uh, as the uh, most useful because uh, Vyakarana more than that, Sarva Vidyana. This is uh, mm. stated in uh, by Ananda Vardhana, Mata Acharya, etc. Because without Vyakarana, nothing moves. right and then uh, uh, i went to uh, as i have already said pada vakya pramana shastra have to be taken into consideration in the beginning so first right. it is uh, vyakaranam then there padam vakyam mahavakyam all these things are artha is not put aside in western hmm. linguistics they started uh, with shabda without uh, any concern to artha later they changed their tack so here i see इन व्याकरण सिद्धे शब्दार्थ संबंधे महावाक्य Uh, I shall explain that later. What is shabda is called because shabda is untranslatable. It is pregnant with meaning. Shabda can be varna, prakriti, pratyaya, pada, vakya, avantar vakya, mahavakya, para pashyanti, majjhima, vaykri, 
and then dhvani and shabda parmanam so at least 14 meanings can be assigned to the term shabda therefore it is pregnant with meaning and one should not try to uh, translate rather than i mean rather should go adapt the term just like yoga punya dharma and that no after yakarna comes nyaya and vaisheshika and with mimamsa that four mimamsa mimamsa is mimamsa is generally four mimamsa which deals with the earlier parts of veda and also called vakya shastram and uttar mimamsa is called vedanta that deals with right. the later parts uh, called upanishads of vedas so right. Pura Mimasa deals with uh, not, on, not only Vedic exegesis, not only Vedic passages and all that and else, but also uh, for, that is for Loka, that is the Sanskrit uh, can be put under two headings, only a slight difference is there. In Veda, in Loka, in both the Sanskrit, there is uh, Swara. Swara is there, but in Veda, it is taken as important. In Loka, Swara is not used. In the form of certain Shabdas only, in the beginning i have explained in the uh, book there is a difference in the form of shabda kannaihi mm-hmm. loka kannevihi veda so l- like that but not in artha meaning does not undergo so both the uh, passages are taken up both kinds of language is taken up by paramimasa it is called vakya shastram the science of uh, sentence is very important and uh, then nyaya and vaisheshika which deal with the uh so pramanas ah right so, no there it is pratyaksha pramanam perception uh, inference and uh, all such kind of things so all the three conglomeration a combination of all the three is very much required for any sanskrit scholar to analyze mm-hmm. to interpret to translate whatever it may be so these things are mainly taken but sometimes what happens uh, in order to interpret or explain certain terms we have to go to yoga shastram or even artha shastra and that means the commonly seen this linguistic science is commonly seen across different uh, what you in the beginning said astadashi vidyasthanam so we have uh, i have taken all these uh, systems and uh, went deep into those things uh, originals then each shastra i have studied with 10 commentaries each the wow. oh yes it is very difficult and nobody would generally do Oh, so since i have knowledge of all the astadasha vidyasthanams i took some uh, jyotisham uh, kalpa and other shastras also where we will find a lot of uh, material which is that is related to uh, the analysis of a language especially at the level of a sentence because sentence is the actual and real unit of a unit of language vakyam and if their meaning is short one we would use vakyam if the meaning is a larger one then he would go for more vakyas more than one vakyam that is called a mahavakya or generally called discourse this is generally what i touched in my uh, book right that's that's frankly quite overwhelming at least for me you're you're just naming these fields for people who might not be familiar with ashtadasha vidya for instance yes that includes the four veda six vedangas yes. and then uh, purana nyaya mimamsa dharma shastra yes. as well as gandharva veda uh, artha shastra yes. ayurveda uh, so many different fields that you you are just uh, uh, you know easily referring to so uh could you help us understand i mean was it your background how did you how did you touch upon so many fields uh could you help us understand a little bit about your own you know school school days to college days and at what stages in your life what did you learn so that uh, anybody any young people who are seeking inspiration or parents um you know who want to understand and see if they can put their children to something to similar so could you help us understand a little bit more about your own you know early stages of schooling and then college and then uh, as you became a professor what you learned at which stage yes uh, actually uh, i come from a family of uh, orthodox uh, brahmins on the banks of river godavari as you cited that is konasim uh, my father's father was a shrauti 
Shruti means he could uh, supervise Veda, the Yajnas, Yagas, and Allah. My mother's right. father was a uh, Siddhanti. He was uh, actually uh, computing uh, the so-called Panchanga or Almanacs. And my right. father was a Ghanapati, plus he studied Vyakaranam uh, and other Shastas also. And he was able to interpret Vedic sentences and all that and could speak in Sanskrit also generally. So Veda and Shastra. Then he got the interest on in these fields because of the whatever I have inherited from my forefathers, I could get this kind of interest and all that. At the age of five, I started because we used it to learn even during the summer holidays and all that. At the age of five, I got by heart our Kosha. My father was insisting upon learning things even during holidays. For some time we can play, some time we can spend otherwise also, but one should learn something or the other because we have to keep up the ancient Indian tradition and the education mm -hmm. that uh, should be on the tip of the tongue rather than in the books. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thesaurus, it is a thesaurus, generally also called uh, generally initially, but uh, Avarakosha and uh, Pani Vyakarna, if you have both of them, then nobody can stop you. In terms of uh, linguistic analysis uh, or interpretation and so on. So then later uh, I was uh, learning the kavyas and all that. Side by side, uh, I was doing the education, the whatever formal education is there in the Western system, uh, okay. elementary school, then high school, uh, then uh, college like that. But uh, during uh, holidays and uh, summer holidays especially, I used to learn uh, these uh, shastras. And uh, whether at the age of 15, I was, uh, I went, underwent uh, this Pohaneno uh, because I was, I was slightly weak due to the Dasha <laughs> problem mm -hmm. in the horoscope, whatever it is. So later I started learning Veda also. So uh, performing Sanjhavandaram Lagnikaryam uh, uh, every day, regularly, daily basis, I used it to learn Veda from my father and also in some other Patshala and uh, some Guru also when I was uh, in the college. So like that Veda and Shastra, another scholar was there who asked me to learn, uh, who came for forward to teach me Jyotisham. So regularly and every day I was learning morning Veda, afternoon Vyakaranam, evening Jyotisham. Like, wow. like hundreds of horoscopes I was studying. Uh, generally this is not seen in uh, the, the, not to blame anybody, but generally the Vyakarnas, those who study Vyakarnam, Mimansa, Nyaya, Vedanta, etc., they never touch any horoscope or interpret or offer uh, these things. Okay. So, but I was learning like that. So later I studied Bhasha Pravina, Telugu Pandit course. I am a Telugu Pandit actually. I have hundreds oh, wow. of, of poems on the tip of my tongue along with Vyakarnam, Telugu Vyakarnam. So after Bhasha Prana, I joined uh, MA Sanskrit Andhra University and then I did PhD on Mahavakya Vichara, a tough topic because Mahavakyas are generally people understand they are there only in Vedanta, that is Upanishads, Tattva Masi, Aivatma, Brahma, etc. But strictly speaking, mm -hmm. I have proved in the thesis, which is hardly 130 pages, but in Sanskrit, that Mahavakyam he is there in all Shastras, that is Vyakaranam, Poromimamsa. Uh, yeah, Alankara Shastra and anyway, Vedanta is also there, Nyaya Vaisheshika and Vyakarnam everywhere. Ramayana is a Mahavakyam, for example, Bharatam is a Mahavakyam. So, how right. is it possible? Like that, uh, my, uh, I was actually culti a, a, a cultivator, a farmer, uh, uh, agriculture was our thing. Uh, I, I used see. to, we had, had land and coconut orchard and cows and the buffaloes were also there. So while grazing those uh, animals also, I used it to learn Shavar with, with my father. So education in both the Oriental system and the Occidental system was possible like that for me. It is a kind of luck for Jan Masikutan, so I'm going to call it. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, the luck is not limited only to you. We are also lucky that you, know, <laughs> you went through that and at least have left behind uh, some works that we can access in languages that uh, some of us at least uh, can access. Uh, okay, so now moving, so that's that's great. I think this gives an insight into, there are some special, you know, circumstances of your life, which is, I think, contributed to, uh, you know, you having this background. Uh, but yeah, I think it would be great if over time, more people are able to kind of, you know, access it in the way that you have been able to. 
Now, obviously, we don't have enough time today to cover all aspects of your book. So <laughs> broadly, maybe we could we could look at it as in two parts. Uh, we could maybe start with you know some aspects of Bharatiya uh, theory. Uh, for instance, Karaka theory. Should we start with that? Could you could you help us understand? You know, for common people who don't know what Karaka theory is, uh, help us understand a little bit more about it and why it is important. See, in English, uh, we call it syntax. Hmm. Syntax is the science of a syntax. Then what happens? As I have already said, in Western linguistics, there are no clear definitions for a Padam Vakim. There are so many definitions of a Padam word. Finally, they arrived at a one conclusion, if you find space before and after something in print or writing, that is called a Padam. <laughs> something like that. For sentence group of words, uh, something like that, they say, but they are not very clear. Whereas in uh, Indian uh, theater, what happens is, Padam is Subantam and Tengantam, according to Panini. So Subantam is uh, noun, Tengantam is uh, verb. Right. Oh, both are required in a sentence. Chaitra Pachiti, for example, Chaitra is cooking. When we take uh, Chaitra, the term, somebody says Chaitra, and what Chaitra is doing? That means there is Akanksha or expectancy for a verb, Kriyapadam. Then mm -hmm. Pachati, cooking. So Chaitra Pachati, yeah. if someone says Pachati only, then cooking. Who is cooking? Akanksha, expectancy for a noun. That means a noun and a verb are bounded like this through Akanksha. Akanksha is put to rest as soon as the other one is supplied. That means if noun and verb are put together, this is what is uh, taken up in Mimasa also. Samhuvyahara, Vakim. Samhuvyahara means uh, proximity. When proximity is possible, two persons are going, they are going together. That means there is some sort of relation, at least friendship. Then only right. both of them can go together. Otherwise, no. Similarly, here also, Chaitraha and Pajiri, Chaitraha Pachati is a sentence. So, Akanksha is there and uh, two more prerequisites to decide as to whether a given group of words can be taken as a sentence or not. Are Yogyata and Akanksha. So, that is, we have already touched. When you separate, if both of them mutually found to be wanting each other, expecting each other, then that particular group of words, there can be two, there can be more. But Akanksha hmm. should be satisfied. Okay. So, here, this Akanksha. Yogyata is, suppose, uh, Akanksha is satisfied. Chaitra is uh, watering with fire, for example, the sentence. Grammatically correct, but on semantic front, it failed to denote a meaning that is acceptable. It, because right. fire doesn't have the phenomenon to water. Therefore, the sentence is wrong. And then asati, asati is uh, proximity. If one wants to employ the words of a sentence. In quick succession, he is supposed to employ those words, Chaitraha, Pachati. But morning he says uh, Chaitraha and evening he says Pachati. This is what is uh, discussed in Dakka Sangraha. Prahare, Prahare, Asaho, Charitani, like that. No, it cannot be said. Or in between, if there is interference of uh, too much of past or other Shabdas, then also it cannot be called a sentence. So Chaitraha, Pachati, immediately one has to this is the general level, general level to watch. But when you take up any language, see the greatness of Karaka theory is that it is applicable to language per se, any language you take. You may take Hindi, you may take Deutsch, German, you may take English or any language. Everywhere, Panini was writing only for Sanskrit, but it is applicable. Srinam Pana Rajyanam Vacha Vartham Shravati. That is from Uttaradam Chaitam of Bhavabhuti. So we people think, Ravidanam is Sadhunam, Artham Vaganavat. We think about something and then use the Shabda. Maybe a sentence. 
But whereas the rishis are like that, some shabda comes out of their mouth and meaning goes running behind the shabda. They do not just like go on thinking about uh, like. So the karka theory is such which explains the role of different shabda. For easy understanding, we can say, we can take English and say, in English we have prepositions, mm. prepositions. Before the noun, these are added in Ganges, with Rama, by Seta, and so on and so forth, for Gargi, like that. Whereas in right. other languages, most of these languages, like Indian vernaculars, we can take uh, Hindi, Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, or take any language, including Sanskrit, they are post positions. If you say in London, in English, it is preposition. If you say London and me in Japanese, that is post position. Then what is the role of these prepositions or prachayas? Prachaya is added after, added to the noun. So there, what is their role? In transformation of meaning, because for transformation of meaning only we employ a shabda. Generally, what what is their role? If you take uh, English only, Rama, uh, what Rama is doing? The, the, there is akanksha, there is expectancy for a verb. In other words, mm. the word in subjective case, Rama is generating a verb. So we okay. are janakatvam karakatvam. Rama, a book to Sita, take the exit, the Yavakti. Ah, Rama, a book to Sita, did he sell or did he give, did he donate? Some verb or the other should be there. So without right. a verb, there cannot be a sentence. Although Nayaikas argue there can be a sentence, but Patanjali clearly says, Astir Bhavanti Paraha, Parijivano of Jasti. Actually, this is said by Kachayana and Patanjali supports it. So even if you say, Vraksha or tree, tree is there. You have to supply mm. the verb. So without verb, there cannot be a sentence. And if you take uh, like uh, uh, with a sword, uh, Chaitra, the tree with a sword. With a sword, what did he do? He cut. The verb should be there. Like that, you can take any sentence involving all the prepositions or postpositions, and you will come to know that. The one which generates a verb, the noun which generates a verb is called karaka, karakatum kriya jantam, except shashti possessive case. In possessive case, what happens? Chaitra's house. They are both are nouns. No kriya is there. Of course, yeah. for sentence, sake of sentence, you may say asti. Chaitra's house mm. is there like that, you can say. For example, just like it is raining, there are expletives. What it, it doesn't denote anything for them. For us, for another wise, that's a different question. So it is saying it means nothing. Similarly, what happened, except Shashti possessive case, all the other vibhaktis, they are called vibhakti prachayas because they are uh, they separate the meaning of pratipatika or the very stem prakriti. Rama is the prakriti, John is the prakriti. Take any language, it doesn't matter. We are universals. Amazing analysis by Panini and others. So, Karakam is the one which generates a verb, and this Karaka theory is nothing but the syntax. Analysis of a sentence. So, only six kinds of Karakas will be there, six kinds of sentences. Take any language across the board, and only Shashti is without a Karaka. These karakas, in other words, if you go deep, it is called a shakti actually. And shakti, okay. this energy, and the dravyam mass are not different. When mm. Chaitra is chopping a tree with a sword, is the sword that is chopping the tree? Or the energy that is there in the sword that is useful in the activity of chopping a tree? It is the energy. But Abhedas, they are not seen separately. In Indian tradition, he asked a beautiful question. What is that that is the great? In Indian tradition, mass and energy are not different. Energy undergoes change and becomes dravyam, that is mass. So the, here it is called Shakti. 
సో దే ఆర్ కట్టుకారకం కర్మకారకం కర్ణకారకం సంప్రదాన కారకం అపాదాన కారకం అండ్ అధికరణ కారకం సిక్స్ కారకాస్ వాట్ ఈస్ కారకం ద శక్తి సో రామా ఈజ్ గోయింగ్ టు టౌన్ ఇఫ్ యు టేక్ రామా ఈజ్ కర్త కర్తృ శక్తి ఈజ్ దేర్ వి కాల్ ఇట్ లైక్ దే కర్మశక్తి చైత్ర ఈజ్ కట్టింగ్ విత్ స్వర్డ్ సో ఇట్ విత్ ద ప్రిపజిషన్ విత్ ఆర్ ఖడ్గేన క్షణక్తి ఖడ్గ ఏన్ అదర్ ఇస్ తృతీయ వృత్తి దేర్ ఈస్ కర్ణశక్తి it is right. being used as an instrument so instrumental case dative case and uh, ablative case and uh, what you call locative case all these cases they are called cases and case endings are the prakriyas so this is uh, uh, briefly about uh, karaka uh, theory great thank you so much professor i'm i'm sure for people who you know are not familiar with this this is already quite a lot of specifics and details but the idea was to just kind of you know uh, help people begin to get to know some of these terms i don't remember having studied any of this in my entire schooling for instance and much later in life that you actually hear these uh, words even at least in my case so uh, on on similar lines uh, sporter um, which which we had said in the introduction that we would cover today is uh, is sporter theory also universal and is it useful in translations could you could you help you know common people understand what is this sporter theory in in brief and how is it useful uh, if it's useful in translations is it? and is sure. if it's universal thank you so before going to tachiris sporter theory uh, let us take it in vetra linguistics this gnanam is not uh, included it is not discussed at all progression there are three things three items three items. శబ్ద అర్థ అండ్ జ్ఞాన వ్యాకరణ ఎవ్రీవేర్ ఎనివే అర్థ మీన్స్ ఫస్ట్ కమ్స్ బౌద్ధార్థ ఓన్లీ ద ఇమేజ్ ద ఇమాజినరీ వచ్ ఎవర్ ఈస్ దేర్ ఇన్ ద మైండ్ ఫస్ట్ సపోజ్ వన్ వాంట్స్ టు స్పీక్ అబౌట్ ఏ కౌ హీ వుడ్ రిమెంబర్ ది కౌ హీ లుక్స్ అట్ ది కౌ హీ గెట్స్ ద పిక్చర్ ఆఫ్ కౌ ఇన్ ది మైండ్ సమ్ టైమ్స్ పిక్చర్ మే నాట్ బి అవైలబుల్ దట్ ఐ విల్ కమ్ టు that point later and then he recollects the shabda related to that artha like gau graham bharya etc and then he would employ the shabda with the help of all the speech organs and the artha travels to the air and reaches the person listener shrota and it enters his mind and he understands that process of speech i shall explain so here sometimes what happens is uh, rama's uh, wishes are sky flowers somebody said sky flower gagana kusumam is not there gaganam is there sky kusumam is also there flower but gagana kusumam is not there the kusumam is blossom and sky is not there nevertheless the person gets some meaning that is gnana that means uh, outside real thing is there inside the mind image or bodhatha is there for but for everything it is not there for example vanja putra for to say is useless fellow people use vanja putra vanja is a barren woman who cannot have who cannot conceive who cannot have children but has some means what does it mean vanja is there putra is there but vanja putra is there he is not there but people have no problem in understanding this so shabda artha gnan three things one has to first accept now what is the origin of spotta theory spotta theory is should be accepted by all but for their operational problems mimamsakas vedantins uh, sankhyas did not accept spotta entire alankara shastra dhvani theory and all other meanings etc depend on spotta theory only it is clearly stated in kavya prakasha and sanyaloka by mamata charya and anandavardhana and vyakarnas alankarikas yogins yoga shastra and some others also accept this spotta theory tell me what is spotta why spotta is the question it will be interesting see a person is speaking what do you mean by speaking he is employing a sentence vakyam what is vakyam vakyam is a, a group of uh, 
uh, which confirms to Akanksha Yogita Asati, leave it there. Uh -huh. What is Padam? Padam is a group of uh, Varnas letters which denotes a single unitary meaning, something like that. Oh, so group of Varnas Padam, group of birds uh, Vakyam, group of Avandra Vakyas Mahavakyam, if you go to that level, leave it. Now Vakyam only, let us take. Uh -huh. What is the problem? The problem is this. A vacuum contains a number of varnas. Each varna disappears as soon as it is pronounced. Which is a pradhansitvad varnana. By the time, so if you take a chaitra, cha, ai, t, r, a. By the time you pronounce tra, chai is not there. By the time you pronounce a, the last letter, all the earlier varnas are gone. Simultaneity, yoga panchim is not there. Simultaneously, all the varnas of a padam are not available. That means if you are the speaker, the bhakta employs a sentence having 24 varnas, for example. By the time he pronounces the 24th varna, all the earlier 23 varnas are gone. Vanished. Nobody can refute this. Nevertheless, the listener Shrota claims, I understood. How? When simultaneously all the Varnas are not available there, how can he claim that he understood the sentence? No. It is not trustworthy, so to say. But it is happening before our eyes. Prachaksha Pramana, perception. So actually, what is the problem? How to solve this problem is a question. This is the actual origin of Spota theory. Panini did not say anything about Spota in his sotras, but in one sotram for this window, he said, Avang Spota Yanasya, Spota in a Rishi had heard a word, Gavaksham also. Goksham I heard. So Goksham, Gavaksham both can be used to mean a window. That is the actual meaning of the sutra. There he mentioned the name of Spotayana. Later Nagesha in one of his works says Spotayana Rishayat Matam. It was proposed, the theory was proposed by Spotayana. Leave it there. Now, what is happening? Let us see. What is speech process? Vavyapara. So, slowly one we have to go. To go. Uh, okay, a person wants to speak about something. There is the artha, that is the vastu, the thing that is there. It can be available, it can be not available outside. That means in the concrete form, it may not be available sometimes. Nevertheless, we don't have any problem in having that in our mind. Once he first, first looks at the artha, gets the Shabda and with the help of his speech organs, he would pronounce that Shabda, Chaitraha, Sita, Maitreyi, like that. Then what happens? This is called Vaikhari Shabda. Shabda is of four types, strictly speaking. Para, Pashyanti, Majjhima, Vaikhari. This is what I mentioned earlier in the meanings of the term Shabda, which you declare untranslatable. Even if you put W in capital, it should not be translated as word. Mm. Now, Paravak is Parabrahman only. In Maitraino, Prashatande, Shanti Parva of Mahabharatam, it is a way Brahmani Vedita J. Two Brahmans one should know. Shabda Brahma Paranjayat, Shabda Brahma and Parabrahma. Shabda Brahma in Ishnataha. Param Brahma, he gets the one who realizes the Shabda Brahman would certainly reach or visualize, would can perceive the Param Brahman. That means he can attain Moksha, general, ordinary language. This is what is said. So, Paravak is for Brahman only. There is no any kind of analysis like Prakriti, Pratyaya, and all that. Then, Pashyanti, Nabhi Samasthita, in the novel, we have Nabhi. We have Pashyanti Vak. 
their maharshis like panini patanjali etc have this separation of prakriti pratyaya root suffix etc sphata sphata is there pratistha madhyama nyaya actually it is madhyama vak called also by the name sphata i shall explain why it is there in the mind and all the three are not audible so the acoustic sounds which of we kail or we claim my hair this thing that does are called vaikri shabda vaikra means body from body it emanates it comes out so it is vaikri shabda vaikri shabda is nothing but the shabda what we hear shabda is of two types explained in tarka sangraha nyaya darshan one is meaningful the other is unmeaningful meaningless so this is about meaningful so now the shabda is pronounced shabda wants some medium to travel so air is the medium for shabda so the varnas which sounds rather if you can say sounds also dhvani also which you pronounce it, they are called prakrita dhvani vaikrita dhvani whatever it is it travels to the medium of air and reaches the ear or ear drum of the listener shabda then it enters the mind of the of shabda the shabda is already registered there okay in his mind and it is first artha then shabda in the case of speaker it is first shabda then artha in the case of listener this shabda then it enters the mind and wakes up the meaning sphata sphatati just explores it wakes up the meaning that is already there in the mind earlier that means the language should be known to both the people then only this is possible one thing but what is shabda what is artha ah for this in yogana shastram third adhyaya 17th sutra says patanjali says shabdarth pratyayanam itretra adhyasat sankaraha tat pravibhag sanyamat sarva bhuta rota gyan in ramayanam we come across hanuman was speaking with mantis with seeta with rama how is it possible It is possible because he is a sanyami. What is sanyama? Yamaniya asana pranayama pratyaha dharana dhyana samadhi ashtangas are there. Okay. All the last three dharana dhyana samadhi trayam ekatra sanyama ha. That is the yoga sutra. These three are called sanyama. The one who has got this, all the three, okay, trinity, he is called sanyami. What is the problem there? The problem is that. शब्द अर्थ प्रत्यय प्रत्यय मीन्स ये ज्ञान देर आर थ्री आइटम्स शब्द इज देर अर्थ इज देर प्रत्यय ज्ञान इज आलो देर अहा बट परस्पराध्यासात बाय सोपर इंपोजिशन ऑफ वन ऑन द अदर देर इज देयर इन द फॉर्म ऑफ एमालगम शंकर हा कैन नॉट बी सेपरेटेड हाउ व्हाट इज द शब्द गौ व्हाट इज द अर्थ मीनिंग यू आर गेटिंग गौ ओनली what is the gyana that is generated by go shabda to go only so gauriti shabda gaurity atha gauriti gyana man cannot separate if one can separate then sarva bhuta rata gyanam then that sanjami will be in a position to understand the languages of animals birds and all that that's why hanuman was able to understand the languages and speak also let us come back now what we said artha one looks at an artha he remains get he recollects the relevant shabda and then employs and then it reaches the ear drums and mind also this is possible if and only if all the three shabda artha and gyana are in the same form otherwise what happens you suppose some this way, speaker said raja the other person may understand jara old age so nadi this person speaker says then the other person uh, listener will understand deena why not other may be changed why not it is not happening because in the mind of the listener as well as speaker the shabda artha jnana are identical same form 
अर्था शब्द इज गौ अर्था इज गौ विज्ञान सो दि क्रम इज देर दकार अवकार विसर्जनीय इन दिच आर्डर दि स्पीकर इज एम्प्लॉइंग दि शब्द इन दि सेम आर्डर इट रीच दि मैं आफ दि पर्सन सो दिन वाट हेपन स्फोट मीन स्फोट दि अर्थ अस्मा स्फोट शब्द शब्द इज काल स्फोट बिकॉज मीनिंग इज मेड क्लियर वै दिस देर फोर शब्द इज स्फोट स्फुट्यते अर्थ स्फोट अर्थ इज आलो स्फोट बिकॉज इट बिकम्स क्लियर क्लियर वै दिस सो दिस इज जनरली दि वाग व्यापार अंड वन के नाट डिनाइ शंकराचार्य एटसेट्रा इन देवताधिकरण सूत्र भाषण इन लाइन वित् मीमा बिकॉज मीमा शिवरस्वामी पूर्वपूर्व वर्ण संस्कार सहित अंत्य वर्ण प्रत्यायक शिवरस्वामी डिफेन्स इज आर्ग्युमेंट दि लास्ट वर्ण इज एवरी वर्ण संस्कार दि लास्ट वर्ण संस्कार Coupled with the 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 sanskaras of the earlier varnas, he is going to generate the understanding, the meaning in the mind of the listener. That is how they go. Then one more thing in this uh, ah spata is uh, if you say spata means uh, how many spata? Eight spata are there. Jati and vyakti generally do not kill a cow. Cow na hantam ya. How many cows? A cow means. All the cows, any cow in the world, in the universe, aha, fetch a cow. How many cows? Only one cow. So, depending on the context, we will decide. This is their native language. We have taken English. Generally, we take Sanskrit, Telugu, even. So, jati will be there, class. Vyakti also will be there, individual. But jati and vyakti, how the meaning is decided? In both the sentences, you find a cow. But there, you said any cow or all the cows. Bahuvachanam, plural. But here you are saying a single cow. In a cow, there will be cowness. Gatva jati. Jati is the one which separates. Generally, we can call it DNA. General jati is the one which separates one thing from the rest of the things in the universe. Gatva. Gatva is not there in a vruksha. In a vruksha, vruksha tam is there. In a tree, tree tam is there. That is denoted by from artha. Gatva, gatva. Either one. So the jati will be there, and the jati cannot be seen. But yekti or the dravyam or the thing which you take, there will be jati, there will be kriya, there will be, I mean, activity and the guna, any kind of property, which are not seen, but they will have their result. Dravyam. In dravyam, you will have jati, blackboard, blackness of the board cannot be separated and seen or shown. Impossible. Forget about it. So I will come to the meaning part. Then I will explain. Explain. Cow. The word has got one meaning according to this baby. In the word, the cow has got five meanings. <laughs> Leave it there. Now, what are when you said? What is that? Is which one to be taken? Varna Parni says the Shyamachyam and has got this meaning. A Varna has got this meaning. Else, someone in PC will say Pada has got some meaning. Mevasra says Pada Artha ha. So, so many Artha ha. What kya? Like that they say, explain. So, what is the actual position? What is the actual position? How meaning is attained? Through which unit of language is it? Varna, arpada, arvatya, something? It is only vakyam. Vakyam is the actual candidate that is transforming the meaning from the listener to the our like, so speaker to the listener from bhakta to shrota. Why? Where are you coming from? Is the question. Hostel. Hostel is an elliptical sentence, some kind of idea, but not a word, because the rest of the meaning is understood shared. Therefore, the words are not used. I am coming from, are to be, okay, are to be supplemented. So ellipses we generally call them. So vacuum is the only candidate or unit, the real unit of language. So vacuum spot, you have to accept. Then the padas etc. Padas are not just for explaining to students only. We split a sentence into padas. A pada into prakriti into prachaya. A prakriti into prachaya. Varna also comes. So there, varna spotta is taken. Pani says, "A has got this meaning." Actually, it is only for maintaining the vyakarana shastra. Start in fear, just as much kids. Otherwise, the varna doesn't have meaning. 
If you one will have that meaning, then it will, it will become Savantamar Tengantam. The problem will be there will be chain reaction. Then Padam. Padam is also used. If one says Rama, Rama is there. Rama has come. Something or the other will be there. So it will be a sentence only. Sometimes some words of the sentence may be used, may not be used. May not be used where there is shared meaning. Understand? Understand. So, one spotta, other spotta, vakya spotta, and then vakya jati spotta, and the yakti spottas, and five uh, those uh, akhanda pata spotta, akhanda vakya spotta like that, and one spotta, totally eight spottas are there. But among them, akhanda vakya jati spotta, akhanda means spotless. Jati is so many because sentences are innumerable. And this part of Vakya is the only candidate that can transfer the meaning. Therefore, Vakya Spata is the Siddhanta. The rest of the Spatas, eight, seven Spatas are useful in just explaining the language without going directly into Spata. And Anaprasana, one is not going to offer rice with uh, this hot uh, mango chutney or uh, <laughs> this pickle to a chain. So we will do that. We will go from one last padas like that. Actual order is vacuum, then padam, then varna. General uh, information about the spot of theory. So this is accepted as you said, because if you take sentences, translation becomes easier. Any language you take, these people are taking words and then they are trying to connect this karaka. It is hmm. not as good as in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is uh, Suitable for computers machines because it is a perfect language. No mistakes are committed by Acharya. But it's another language, just yes, English, if you take which English, American English, the president arrives on Sunday. British English, the president arrives on Sunday. He has said that he is going, British English. He says he is going, American English. Indian English, we have. I am feeling healthy. I feel healthy. I am feeling healthy. <laughs> this is only Indian English. So English has got different facets. Whereas Sanskritam is not. So Sanskritam stood like that and is part of theory. Suppose if you go to parliament or anywhere, I told people, you use text, part of theory, translation becomes easier. Otherwise, machine translation is a myth because machine doesn't have buddhi and it is impossible to inject or insert buddhi into a machine. I think... Wonderful, you... wonderful. That's, that's, uh, that, that was very lucid. I think to be able to speak uh, so succinctly about that theory and I'm sure there is more that you can speak about it uh, but I'm mindful of the fact that uh, your time is valuable <laughs> and therefore we will move from now having seen Karaka and Skota in very uh, you know in, in a brief kind of a way I'd like to move to two examples I had three in mind actually but we will keep it to two now uh, I'd like to focus on the you know, the occidental part of it now. Now, on page 94 of your book, uh, you write about some facets of the work of the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Saussure. Saussure. Uh, now, yeah. No so Saussure uh, ranks second only after Plato and Noam Chomsky yes. in Margaret and Thomas's list of 50 key thinkers on yes. language and linguistics. This yes. was a book published in 2011. Yes. So she has this list of 50 thinkers she mm -hmm. thinks are the most important in the world and that starts with Plato mm -hmm. and then it is Saussure and then finally Chomsky. Now uh, you have you have commented on some of his, uh, some aspects of his work. Very briefly if you could help uh, our listeners get a you know a sense of what you had commented on on his work. The Lange and Perol, he calls. Uh, what he meant is uh, later Chomsky said, so sure, they started this. And later Chomsky said, uh, this uh, performance uh, and uh, the competence and performance. What he call is actually competence is Pratibha. Pratibha is an inherited mental capacity from life to life. Okay. That will be helpful in the speech process I mean, in the activity of speaking and then the parole or what they call performance is nothing but usage prayoga shabda prayoga yavahara generally we call 
So Pratibha and Vyavahara, whatever you have in Bakipadhyam of Parthraharandal, they named it like that. Although Sushur studied Lerant, Panini, etc., he did not disclose. That is the great thing. And he said the arbitrary meaning is arbitrary. Actually, it is Siddhe Shabda Samman they have already quoted. Isn't it? So Shabda Arma and the relation between both of them should be accepted as immutable. Today, if you pita means father and tomorrow it means mother, one cannot write a grammar. Not possible. So what they did, they try to understand the language, but somehow could not reach the goal and went on changing these things, especially this Chamsky. Finally, state grammar he started. Then he went to structuralism, this thing, that thing, GP theory, government binding theory, now minimalistic approach he ended it, but could not find a single theory. He himself refuted these. And again, like an ant on a ball, it reached finite state grammar. What is finite? What is grammar? Could not explain. So these people, and also first they started their Western linguistics with a premise, huh? major premise that is, no, 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 meaning has got nothing to do with Shabda. How can you separate Shabda from Artha? Without Artha, how can there be any? Then it will be meaningless. Later they realized and they came back and said, no, 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 Artha also has to be taken into consideration. So they went on changing their own theories, rather others refuted their theory. So they cannot be called theories, rather it is better to put them hypothesis. So even till today, till today, they could not have a comprehensive, okay, dependable so-called grammar for any language. You may take uh, even artificial languages like Esperanto, Whatever it may be. Whereas in Indian subcontinents, we have perfect, permanent, immutable, unquestionable, irrefutable theories from Parni mm. and others. So, but what they thought is it will have some mental uh, thing of uh, he, he says uh, that German uh, uh, linguist says, you know, some picture or something like that in the mind. Etc. That is what we said, this thought, etc. also. Isn't it? First, it, he gets a picture of in the mind, both Isn't it? Another form of meaning, Humboldt says. So, all those things, they yeah. have some ideas and they studied uh, these things, but did not go through uh, deep into the systems of Indian philosophy. But whatever may be the reason, and could not uh, actually do justice to that, much more they failed on this uh, discourse, what I call uh, Mahavakyam. What is Mahavakyam? So this is briefly about uh, this. Uh... Great, great. You mentioned you mentioned Noam Chomsky and you mentioned Humboldt as well in in what you just briefly touched upon. And for people who don't know, Humboldt was a, per, a Prussian philosopher, uh, philosopher, linguist, government functionary, diplomat, and founder of the Humboldt University of Berlin, right. which was named after him in 1949. Yes, and uh, Noam Chomsky and sure is perhaps a little more familiar to people who are not related to grammar per se uh, because he's contemporary he's an american linguist yes. who's considered by some to be the father of uh -huh. modern linguistics <laughs> so uh professor subramaniam in his book has actually critically analyzed some aspects of not just these three uh you know well-known names in western linguistics but more and foregrounded that's the kind of analysis wh while one needs to first be rooted and clear about concepts in one's own tradition. But uh, only after that, one can perhaps, you know, look at another tradition from this lens and then share comparative perspectives. That's something that I find uh, very rare. And uh, there's so much more in your book, which unfortunately, today we don't have the time to kind of uh, cover. But I hope this uh, interests people who are listening and for those uh, to whom these aspects matter and who have not read your book would actually try and find a copy and read it. Now I'd like to close our conversation today by requesting you to kind of name two or three areas of research that you think uh, should be carried forward. I mean, should be undertaken in the future. Uh, if there are young researchers who are listening to this, what would you, what would you say are two, two or three important areas of research that should be undertaken in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Yes. It is better if we, the young students will study the Pani and grammar and also some, some aspects of 
న్యాయ విశేషిక ఆల్సో ఓకే అండ్ దెన్ గో ఆన్ డూయింగ్ రీసెర్చ్ ఆఫ్ అదర్ లాంగ్వేజెస్ అండ్ టుడే ఇది ఎలక్ట్రానిక్ మీడియా వాట్స్ ఎ వెరీ ఫాస్ట్ ట్రాన్స్లేషన్ ఆఫ్ దీస్ న్యూస్ ఎక్సెట్రా ఫ్రమ్ వన్ లాంగ్వేజ్ టు ది అదర్ అండ్ ఇఫ్ దే స్టడీ దిస్ థాటా థీరీ అండ్ వాట్ ఎవర్ థీరీస్ వీ హ్యావ్ ఇన్ మేబీ సెంటెన్స్ ఇట్ మేబీ వాక్యం ఆర్ మహావాక్యం అండ్ సెమాంటిక్ పార్ట్ ఆల్సో హౌ మెనీ కైండ్స్ ఆఫ్ మీనింగ్ వాక్యార్థ ప్రైమరీ మీనింగ్ సెకండరీ మీనింగ్ లక్ష్యార్థ అండ్ సజెస్టెడ్ మీనింగ్ ఏదర్ ధ్వని ఆర్ వ్యంగ్యార్థ అండ్ తాత్పర్యం దట్ ఈస్ అ పర్పోర్ట్ ఇఫ్ దే స్టడీ ఆల్ దీస్ యూనివర్సల్స్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియన్ గ్రామాటికల్ ట్రెడిషన్ ఇట్ ఇన్క్లూడ్స్ న్యాయ వైశిక మేమాస్ ఆల్సో అండ్ దెన్ అప్లై ఫర్ ట్రాన్స్లేషన్ దే విల్ గెట్ గుడ్ జాబ్స్ అండ్ ఆల్సో ఇట్ విల్ బి యూస్ఫుల్ అక్రాస్ ది గ్లోబ్ ఎస్పెషలీ వెన్ వన్ వాంట్స్ టు ట్రాన్స్లేట్ ఇట్ టు అదర్ లాంగ్వేజ్ టు స్పాటా థీరీ దే కెన్ డూ ఇట్ వెరీ ఫాస్ట్ బికాస్ బౌద్ధార్థ ఈస్ టేకింగ్ వాట్ ఎవర్ దేర్ ఇన్ ది మైండ్ దట్ మీన్స్ వర్డ్ టు వర్డ్ ట్రాన్స్లేషన్ విల్ నాట్ డూ నో people have spent a lot of money but failed in our friends it is not possible to have machine translation at that speed so better to have have manual translation having good command upon both the source language and target language and apply spot theory and then translate it very fast so the so the study of language especially the our indian grammatical tradition and then the semantics the nuances of semantics that are there here embedded and then the spotter theory and then go for translation these are the areas which would i mean just uh, will give jobs also to these people and will be useful uh, and save a lot of time so i think uh, great okay yeah thank you so much professor i think uh, for people who are listening with the interest to take this forward in some ways either in terms of research or in terms of opportunities i hope uh, they have made a note of Uh, some of what you said uh once again i'd like to really thank you for your time today for uh i know this has been brief we need a lot more time to actually get into more specifics but the idea was to kind of you know get the word out so to speak about your book and i think there's so much more in it uh so anybody who's listening and who hasn't read it uh also if you have any questions Uh, for the professor he's kind enough to you know respond to it on email you could write to him his email address is there on his blog spot id uh, uh web web link sorry that is koradiem k o r a d e e y a m if you just search for this word uh you will get a blog spot link and all his coordinates are available over there uh, that link is also there in the announcement for this conversation so people can access that link from there as well once again professor thank you for your time and we look forward to having you uh, for future conversations on other topics uh, as part of indica cbl sure. thank you once very much thankful yes. to indica academy and uh, shri harikiran garu for uh, giving me a chance uh, to uh, just deliberate uh, myself and uh, thank you very much uh, also to, uh, to giving me so uh, the chance to discuss many aspects of the book huh? thank you very much sir vibhya ashish thank you professor dhanyawad dhanyawad